We are strong. We are a family. Terror aftermath. San Bernardino County leaders promise healing and rebuilding after the bloody attack. Obama offers assurance. However, no change in policy or military strategy. The crown jewel, completing the dome artwork at the National Shrine a century after construction began. And Pearl Harbor remembered. President Roosevelt called it a day which will live in infamy 74 years ago. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Monday, December 7th, 2015. Good evening, thank you for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick with your news now. There are new security measures for people returning to work today in San Bernardino County, California. A government employee and his wife are blamed for a terror attack last week there that left 14 people dead. Local leaders spoke openly today about the attack and its aftermath. They say they want to help people return to a normal life. Public Health Director Trudy Raimundo is one of the victims of the shootings. She's grateful for the outpouring of support from across the world. I ask that you come together and hold each other strong because it is this strength that will help us heal. Meanwhile, Pakistan has joined an international investigation into how the suspects became radicalized. Investigators say the couple engaged in target practice just days before the attack. President Obama vows the terror group ISIS will be destroyed. He addressed the nation with a rare speech from the Oval Office during primetime Sunday. The threat from terrorism is real, but we will overcome it. President Obama speaks passionately to millions in a rare Oval Office address last night. He strongly condemns ISIS, calling Wednesday's mass shooting in San Bernardino a terrorist attack. It is clear that the two of them have, had gone down the dark path of radicalization. So this was an act of terrorism. Obama doubling down on his four-point strategy to defeat the terrorist group. The strategy that we are using now, airstrikes, special forces, and working with local forces who are fighting to regain control of their own country, won't require us sending a new generation of Americans overseas to fight and die for another decade on foreign soil. At home, Obama wants stronger screenings on people arriving in the U.S. without a visa. He insists on more gun control. Congress should act to make sure no one on a no-fly list is able to buy a gun. President Obama ending his 13-minute speech with an appeal to Muslims to root out extremist ideology, also calling on Americans to reject discrimination. Muslim Americans are our friends and our neighbors, our co-workers, our sports heroes. And yes, they are our men and women in uniform who are willing to die in defense of our country. Republican critics say the president's speech doesn't go far enough. Our White House correspondent and political director Lauren Ashburn has more. Lauren? Brian, the president believes that his speech was very well received and that those who are critical of it are Republicans, especially those who want his job, like Marco Rubio, Rand Paul, and Donald Trump. Donald Trump last night was live tweeting, and he said, is that all there is? We need a new president fast. So I was disappointed last night when the president failed to lay out any new steps to fight this, this threat. Instead, he doubled down on a strategy of hesitancy and half measures. This should not just be a wake-up call. It should be a call to action. For far too long, we have allowed extremists to reclaim their momentum, surging from terror cells into full-fledged terrorist armies. As a result, I believe the state of our homeland is increasingly not secure. This is a dangerous organization that the United States and the other 65 members of our coalition have mobilized to counter. Uh, so the president uh, and the leaders of countries around the world certainly takes this threat seriously. But it's also important for us to recognize it uh, for what it is. And it is very clear from what you're hearing that the White House rejects that its strategy is not working. Meanwhile, Donald Trump has just issued a release saying that he is going to ban all Muslims from entering the United States. That is what he would do if he were president. Brian? Lauren Ashburn at the White House. Thank you.
Catherine Gorka, president of the Council on Global Security, is with us. Catherine, did the Oval Office speech reassure the American people in any way? I don't think it did. Uh, President Obama told us something that we already knew, that this was an act of terrorism. And more than anything, it felt like a chastisement. He's telling Americans, don't be divisive or bigoted. But those people in San Bernardino did everything right. They held a baby shower for this couple who were, the woman was a new immigrant. And look what they got in return. And it may be a small detail, but I don't think it helped that the prompter seemed to be to the side of the camera so that he wasn't even looking us in the eye when he spoke to us. Yeah, this is a point where he wanted to appear very presidential and reassuring. Why did he wait so long to acknowledge this as terrorism? Well, I think there was a real need for the FBI and law enforcement to know for a fact that it was terrorism, but we knew that several days ago. So one does have to ask, why did President Obama not respond sooner? And also we have to ask, why did he not go to San Bernardino himself? I think he really should have been there. You say there's something fundamentally wrong with his approach. President Obama believes that terrorism is the fault of the United States, that the uh, radicalism that has arisen is because of the American president presence in the Middle East, and that if once we stay away, this problem will go away. That is not the case. We have a much bigger problem. The groundwork has been laid for decades by mosques, radical mosques, radical imams, and that's the real problem that we see. This gesture of making sure that people on a no-fly list can't buy guns, is that more political or substantive? I think it's a step, but it's far too little. Um, and I think it does gel with his broader goal of gun control. Excellent point. Catherine Gorka with the Council on Global Security. Thanks so much for your insight tonight. Thank you. Other stories our EWTN News Nightly team is covering in today's world. The United States is about to unveil a new national terror alert system. It should help us understand how to respond to threats. We need a system that informs the public at large what we are seeing, even if what we are seeing could be self-evident to the public, but what we are seeing what we are doing about it and what we are asking the public to do. The original terror alert implemented after 9-11 used a color-coded system. It was eventually replaced by a two-tier advisory, which has never been used. Police in Chicago face more scrutiny. The U.S. Attorney General launches a federal civil rights investigation. We will examine a number of issues related to the Chicago Police Department's use of force including its use of deadly force. Protesters called for a federal probe after dash cam video showed the 2014 death of Laquan McDonald. Officer Jason Van Dyke is now charged with murder in connection with his death. The man accused of a London terror attack is now charged with attempted murder. He reportedly shouted, this is for Syria, as he stabbed a passenger in the underground. The victim survived with emergency surgery. The suspect's arrest was caught on camera, and today he appeared in court. Well, many of us turn to prayer when facing tragedies such as the San Bernardino shootings. It's now becoming the focus of some media backlash. A New York Daily News headline last week said, God isn't fixing this. In a recent Federalist article, Molly Hemingway dissects those criticisms of prayer. Molly is joining us tonight. How can anyone find fault with prayer? Why this backlash? You know, it wasn't just the New York Daily News. It was also Gene Weingarten at the Washington Post who said that people who pray are the real problem and they should slink away. The Huffington Post had an article against prayer. It was really stunning to see so many journalists take this approach. And I think what it was was really more of like a temper tantrum. A lot of these people are very focused on the idea that a larger government can take care of the problem of evil, the, of the human condition. And they've been frustrated that they haven't been able to convince more more people that government control over guns is a good idea and it was just a temper tantrum. Perhaps they don't understand that prayer doesn't change God. That's ridiculous. It changes us. It's certainly true they know basically nothing about <laughs> prayer and how central it is to the life of a Christian. I mean, it's really remarkable when you look throughout the scripture from the very beginning, it, learning about Adam and Eve talking to God all the way to the revelation of St. John, where you where he has a vision of the consummation of all these prayers. You have Jesus teaching us the Lord's Prayer and telling us how to pray and, and telling us to do it. And so this is a very important thing for the life of a Christian and the media just clearly don't understand that. But we so often say our thoughts and prayers are with you. Do you think that maybe pairing those two lessens the significance or I the intention of prayer. It has, it has had the effect of maybe making people think that prayer is nothing more than a thought. They actually are two separate 
there's a different meaning between those two things. You pray to God, you offer your thoughts of sympathy to victims of a tragedy. And so when people say thoughts and prayers, they're trying to express those very distinct concepts, but I do think uh, it's important to separate them out. Well, clearly some action needs to be taken here. Where do you think prayer fits into a plan of action? Well, first and foremost, prayer is an important action, it and is. it's important that people understand that for the Christian it is the most important action. The Christian does not put his trust in government. He puts his trust in God and, and begins everything from that point. Having said that, there are, of course, any number of things that Christians and other people can do to deal with the problem of evil, and some of those might involve government, and a lot of them, of course, involve raising your family well, being involved in the community, having strong churches, and things that are actually much more effective at having healthy communities. And it doesn't help that religion is sort of at the center of all this, and, and you know, differences of religion, so it's a very complicated issue, but certainly thank God for prayer that we have something to do, some action to take. Molly Hemingway, we really appreciated your article. Thanks for joining us to talk about it. Thank you. Well, the Vatican makes last minute preparations for the beginning of the Jubilee Year of Mercy. It starts tomorrow on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Security is tight around the Vatican and throughout Rome in the wake of the Paris attacks. 100,000 pilgrims are expected in St. Peter's Square for the opening of the Holy Door. Repentant pilgrims traveling to Rome have the chance to gain special graces by walking through that door. There's also a trial going on this week at the Vatican. The National Catholic Register's Ed Penton is in Rome. And what's the latest with that trial, Ed? Uh, the latest, Brian, is that uh, the Vatican put out a statement today saying, uh, reassuring people that the, the trial is fair um, and that they're getting uh, uh, a fair trial. And they're allowed also to bring to trial um, anyone they wish. Uh, one of the defendants has asked for close advisors of Pope Francis to be, to be called. Um, and that includes Cardinal Pietro Parolin, his Secretary of State. Um, so there's, there's a lot of reassurance there that, uh, that there is a fair trial after lots of criticism in the past few weeks that uh, it might not be. This trial dealing with five people accused of stealing and publishing leaked documents. So also, can you tell us about Italian police making an arrest in connection with a terror threat? Yes, they've arrested a 45-year-old Iraqi man who's been accused of uh, recruiting ISIS fighters. He was arrested in Bari in southwest Italy. And uh, funny enough, that is where four Kosovars were arrested last week, um, suspected of um, terrorist activity, also targeting uh, the Pope. And finally, in an effort to be more transparent with its finances, the Vatican is bringing in a major auditing firm. Tell us about that. That's right. They brought in one of the so-called big four auditing firms, Price Waterhouse Coopers, who are supposed to be one of the best um, at uncovering um, any kind of hidden uh, financial activity. Uh, there has been concern that certain things won't be uh, open to scrutiny, um, but we're told that uh, having one of these firms involved will make sure that it'll be very, very difficult to hide any sort of underhand financial activity. So that, again, is a, a kind of reassurance from the Vatican today, or if we can. A lot of news from Rome. Our correspondent for the National Catholic Register, Ed Penton. Ed, thank you. Thanks, Brian. Coming up, schools close and traffic is restricted as Beijing, China is under a red alert for smog. And a handful of survivors of the attack on Pearl Harbor gather to remember that infamous day 74 years ago. Today, December 7th, is the Feast of St. Ambrose, Bishop and Doctor of the Church. He was a close friend to St. Augustine, aiding in Augustine's conversion. Thanks for joining us this Monday evening. I'm Brian Patrick. Venezuela's opposition wins control of the National Assembly by a landslide, delivering a major blow to ruling socialists. <laughs> Supporters celebrate on the streets of Caracas early this morning. The opposition won at least 99 seats in the 167-seat legislature. The Socialist Party winning just 46 seats in the 19 remaining races are up for grabs. Opposition hopes to challenge President Nicolas Maduro's grip on power in Venezuela. Beijing issues its first red alert for smog, urging schools to close and restricting traffic flow. The red alert is the most serious warning. The heavy smog is expected to improve possibly by Thursday, but not until. Most of the pollution is blamed on coal-fired power plants. Vehicle emissions, construction and factories also contribute to it. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry says a new climate agreement could change the world. Negotiators from 190 countries try to strike a deal in Paris this week. 
Kerry says the proposal has the private sector leading the development of new sustainable power sources. A Parigi, ogni sforzo. Pope Francis follows the developments in Paris, saying every effort should be made to mitigate the impact of climate change. The Pope also calls on countries to tackle poverty and let human dignity flourish. The Knights of Columbus act on the Holy Father's call to help those persecuted in the Middle East. The Knights are raising millions of dollars for food, shelter, education and medical clinics. They're also urging Congress to declare a genocide against Christians. Patrick Kelly is Vice President for Public Policy with the Knights of Columbus. Patrick, with the State Department poised to declare the assault on the Yazidis in the Middle East a genocide, where does that leave Christians there? Uh, Brian, it basically, it leaves Christians out in the cold, uh, so to speak. Um, the Christians have experienced the same persecution that the Yazidis have. Uh, and so that's why we strongly feel that the State Department should include Christians and other religious minorities in this statement. Uh, the, the Knights of Columbus, the Supreme Knight, has sent a letter to the Secretary of State to that effect with other signatories asking for a meeting with him to talk this over and to present evidence. I know you monitor the situations in these refugee camps. What are some of the problems there? The major problem in the, in the, the refugee camps are that Christians are not going into the camps because they're experiencing persecution within the camps. We've had reports that ISIS, uh, ISIS fighters and militia have gone into the camps to target Christians and that they've even taken uh, young women and girls as sex slaves. So what that does is Christians then avoid the camps, then they're not in the whole UN process for refugee status. We're in Advent now. What is being done to help the Christians who are fleeing their homes in the preparation for Christmas? Uh, well, the Knights, we're continuing our, our food aid over Christmas, but we're also sending 10,000 coats uh, to the refugee camps for children, uh, working through the Chaldean Archbishop of Erbil. Uh, so, so at least the children there will have some Christmas present this, this Christmas. And one that they can certainly use as the cold weather approaches. How can we help with this effort? I would say um, the most important thing, of course, like your previous guest said, is to pray, the efficacy of prayer, but also go to christiansatrisk.org, which, which is a website the Knights have set up to allow us to get, to get aid to Christians. Uh, and and I, I think also in your spheres of influence, everyone can actually talk about this with their friends and, and really pray about it. I think that's very important. Don't let these Christians get lost. Christiansatrisk.org. Patrick Kelly with the Knights of Columbus, thank you. Thank you, good to be with you. We appreciate the Knights. Well, December 7th, 1941, a day that lives in infamy. 74 years ago, Japanese planes attacked Pearl Harbor, stunning the nation, propelling the U.S. into the Second World War. Jason Calvi shows us today's remembrance here in Washington. Those Japanese planes thundering over Pearl Harbor killed 2,400 Americans. Two of those who survived that infamous day saluted their fallen troops today. It was part of Pearl Harbor Day at the National World War II Memorial. It was just a complete disaster. We, we were so un unprepared, so, so innocent. It's, it's, we couldn't, it's hard to believe. A story of that infamous day from America's greatest generation. Reporting here at the National World War II Memorial, Jason Calvi, EWTN News Nightly. Up next, on the vigil of the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, we show you the plan to complete dome artwork at her national shrine. And Pope Francis connects with Assisi for a Christmas tree light. Thanks for joining us Monday evening, December the 7th. I'm Brian Patrick, and today marks the 50th anniversary of Dignitatis Humanae, or On the Dignity of the Human Person. It is a key document in the recent history of our Catholic Church. The work was released at the close of Vatican II in 1965. It affirms the Catholic belief that the human person has a right to religious freedom. Writing in a Wall Street Journal editorial, Father Arnie Panula says it's as important as ever today as it ever was. Father Panula is here with us. He heads the Catholic Information Center here in D.C. So 50 years later, why do you think this work is as important as ever? Brian, I think it's, it's important because in 1965, religious liberty really was something that we took for granted. 
we thought that we were in a position to help defend religious liberty in the world, and, and we discover now uh, that, in fact, 50 years later, that we no longer have that solid base. We've been shaken from within. You know, it's difficult to carry on a battle when your own home base is under attack. That communist world, the Eastern Bloc, the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. they were repressed, we were free. What can our government learn from this document, do you think? I think what the government can learn from this document is that uh, the basic principles of our Constitution, of our Declaration of Independence, of the Bill of Rights, are, are reaffirmed in this uh, with a profundity which doesn't appear in those documents themselves. It, there's really a great philosophical, theological foundation in Dignitatis Humani, which the Founding Fathers may have taken for granted, but it wasn't really, I think, in their thoughts. And certainly, I think, 50 years, you know, well, 250 years from that time, uh, you know, it, I think those foundational principles have been very much lost. You call this at once revolutionary and reaffirming of church teaching. Explain that. It's revolutionary because in 1965, the church really did not speak that often about the, uh, the importance of religious freedom, we more or less took it for granted that people should be Catholic, that the truth should prevail. And, and we've come to discover, of course, with a greater the pluralism within the United States, that, uh, in fact, John Courtney Murray was one of the key uh, writers of that document, uh, Dignitatis Humanity, because he, he had experienced a religious freedom in a pluralistic society was such an important thing. It's also reaffirming because uh, it's not new. It goes back, we can think back, for example, John Henry Newman spoke about conscience. Yeah, and it's true. And you go back to the, our Lord said, whoever wishes to follow me, he didn't make it mandatory. Uh, the, the, uh, the apostles, certainly St. Paul made it clear, you know, God wants all men to come to the, you know, to the truth and to follow him. But he, it's, 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 it's an invitation. It's not, not something which is imposed upon them. Very enlightening. Father Ernie Panula with the CIC, the Catholic Information Center. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. It's been great to be with you. Thanks, Father. Well, almost 100 years after its first stone was laid, the National Basilica in Washington is one step closer to finishing its crowning jewel, the iconic Central Dome. Wyatt Goolsby has that story. When it comes to symbols of Catholicism in America, the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception tops the list. Over the decades, it's welcomed everyone from pilgrims to popes. The Holy Father canonized St. Junipero Serra outside the shrine, and he also gave his blessings to a project at the center of the Basilica, the Trinity Dome. For years, Washington's Basilica has been working to complete a number of their artistic pieces. When it's finished, the Trinity Dome will actually follow in the same pattern as a number of other domes that are visible in the shrine itself. Just over my shoulder is the Redemption Dome, which was dedicated in 2006, and over on the other side, the Knights of Columbus Incarnation Dome, dedicated in 2007. The central dome is 159 feet above the ground. It's five times bigger than the other domes. The shrine's rector says the Trinity Dome is the last piece to complete the church a place where Catholics from all over the country gather. We really and truly see the face of the Catholic Church walk through our doors. We can call it a mosaic of peoples, if you will. And so we see all kinds of folks, all kinds of expressions of faith. And so when people come here, they are coming here to not only pray, but also to express their devotion to Our Lady. The dome will depict various saints and the Blessed Mother. Contractors in Virginia have begun the work, but the final bill won't be cheap, $20 million. In November, the U.S. bishops agreed to take up a nationwide second collection for the dome in 2017. This to me seems not only legitimate and understandable, but a very noble cause. It is time that we finished what was begun over 100 years ago. Donations are still needed, but Monsignor Rossi says the shrine is moving forward on the dome, a project 100 years in the making. Wyatt Goolsby, EWTN News Nightly. Thank you, Wyatt. The Holy Father takes part in a Christmas tree lighting in Assisi from afar. 
He lit a candle at the Vatican Sunday as the tree was lit in front of St. Francis's Basilica in Assisi. Italian children singing Christmas carols in a wooden fishing boat used by North African migrants to sail to Italy in 2014 was placed at the foot of the tree. Pope Francis prayed for the many immigrants who lost their lives in the past year trying to reach Europe. Until tomorrow, thanks for joining us tonight. For the EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Brian Patrick. Good night and God bless you.